So starting off, the reason why we're having this conversation is that it is more common than people might realize for projects to have two different architects. And we get we have conversations with clients and other folks every now and then who have a situation like that and they're trying to understand, should I have two architects, should I not, right? Um, I think the first question we're going to answer, though, is what is the difference between these two architects and what are the different responsibilities? So uh, first of all, typically on a project, there's only one architect, right? And that architect kind of wears two hats, we could say. They're responsible for the design of the building, and they're also responsible for the more technical aspects of the project. So that would include producing construction documents, which the contractor builds from. It would include producing permit drawings and getting a permit. It would also include construction administration, which is the service that architects provide during construction, more or less oversight over the contractor, let's say. So an architect on one project does both things, if you, if you could draw a line between those two sides. In the case of two architects on one project, that's when you have a design architect and architect of record. And the design architect, as you would guess, is the one who's responsible and in charge of and leading all the design decisions, right? Um, so anything having to do with obviously how the building looks, the shape of the building, um, and could be even whatever impacts the experience that users of the building have, which could even go to invisible things. For example, fenestration, glass, uh, insulation, uh, HVAC, those things are, let's say, hidden in a way, but they would greatly impact how a person feels in the space. The design architect might also have input in that category. So design is the design architect's responsibility. The architect of record, uh, also known as the executive architect, is the one who's responsible for all the other stuff that I mentioned, right? And the reason why they are often called the architect of record is because they're the architect who actually stamps the drawings with their architecture stamp, which gets submitted to the building department. So they are the architect of record. Um, it's probably important to, to note that the, the title design architect is not really an official title. Um, we just kind of use the word design in there to distinguish them from the AOR or the executive architects. But those are roughly the two kind of different responsibilities. Um, so you're kind of splitting it across two different offices in that case. Right. And I think w the, the following question is, well, what would you need both of them? Right. Mm -hmm. So I think the first scenario is that your architect is not local. You mm -hmm. know, so let's say you... Um, you client have a project and you want to build a house in Brazil, but you're hiring, let's say, like a California architecture office. Mm -hmm. Well, it's outside of their geographic location and their, their kind of like range of expertise, right? And even if the the training of an architect like worldwide is similar-ish from countries to countries, the project very much, um, you know, gets built in a specific location, yeah. right? And that definitely impacts the way it's being built, the way it's been legally approved and all of those things. So, mm -hmm. you know, things that would make kind of like a, a project unique to its location would be, for example, the constructions, right? Yep. The means and methods, the local materials, the local mm -hmm. techniques, like kind of like being familiar with, you know, the labor that is there and the way they work, right? It's crucial to building a, a building. Um, the next thing is environmental context. The way you design and build a, a house in California might be very different than one in Brazil. For sure. Because of the climate, yeah. the humidity, air, the wind, like the, yeah, even, whatever you call it. Yeah, even um, seismic concerns. Yeah. Even yeah. if you're building on the East Coast versus the West Coast, building in California is very different because we have earthquakes. Yeah. Building on the East Coast is different because of that. I think also culturally, um, mm -hmm. you know, if you're, if you're a mindful architect, you would want to kind of understand how do people live and, and even work in those specific locations that are outside of where you usually operate. Yeah. Um, so having someone that is you know local is beneficial. Yeah, and I think that's a great point because that's a good example of it's, it's not just... So it, previously I was saying that the responsibilities of the executive architect are a lot of the technical aspects, you could say, but it also bleeds over to design. Yeah. Because drawing a delineation between design and then construction, detailing, and culture and all this stuff is not so simple. So this is starting, the cultural aspect is starting to highlight how the two kind of blur, right? And they inform each other. And I mean, absolutely, if you're designing for clients in Hong Kong, right, it's a different culture than designing for 
people in LA and yeah. even sometimes within the United States or different cultures. Um, so or, I think that's a very important. Or I don't know, you're designing a school in yeah. South Africa or whatever. Like, yeah. well, maybe the way the school works there is very different from like the US way of working. Yep. So I think, as you said, like the uh, the actual executive architect could also very much educate the design architect in some on some of those things. Absolutely. Um, the next thing is permitting approval, and of course, you know those are very tied to local building codes mm -hmm. and local zoning codes. So you need someone who is familiar with that um, and kind of can can guide the project through. The next thing is coordination. When you when you build buildings, um, you work with other consultants on the project, right? Like structural engineer, mechanical engineer, landscape architects, and, and contractors. Contractors. So you need somebody who is familiar again with those uh, local people. Mm -hmm. Um, in order again to make the project relevant to where it's going to be. And built. most of the time, the folks that you mentioned, they are local to the project. Um, not always the case, but often is the case, right? Because it, again, they're, those fields you mentioned get more into the technical realm and they need to have an understanding of the local jurisdictions and the way things are done, the materials, the availability of stuff, how things are put together, and uh, having sort of like a liaison on ground is, is part of the the role of the executive architect. And if your architect, and the other thing is the, the licensure, right? If your mm -hmm. architect is not local to the project, and in this case, we're talking like from a different country, they're most likely not even legally allowed to be, um, you know, taking on those efforts because they, they don't have the, the licensure in that specific country. Yeah, yeah, and, and that gets to the next question, which is, well, what sort of project would be considered non-local and it, which would require me to have you know two different architects um it's a good question it varies it really depends on on, on the region you're talking about but uh, for example even within the united states the way the architects and architects license work is it's per state so for example i'm licensed in new york and california and a lot of architects are licensed in uh, maybe one or two states. In some offices, within the entire office, they'll have architects who are licensed in many other states than that, right? So uh, just within the United States, that means that if, if an architect is licensed in Texas, right, they cannot do, they cannot operate as an architect in another state. Um, however, again, within the United States, it's actually relatively easy f most of the times an asterisk for an architect to seek reciprocity and then become licensed in another state. So just real quick, um, in the US, the arch an architect has to have a certain amount of experience that they take a bunch of exams, which are not pleasant and they're very long, and then they're licensed in one state. And uh, very often that reciprocity process, there's not an extra exam required. You have to pay fees and whatnot, but then you become licensed over there. That's not always the case because different states have different regulations. California is one of the most difficult ones. So that's an example of, let's say your architect is licensed in, I don't know, Arkansas or something, and they want to operate as an architect in California, they would have to take an additional exam and it would be difficult, more difficult for them to bridge that gap rather than if they were licensed in California going to the other direction, if that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And it's also important to highlight that if we're talking international, then almost in every instance, you would have a local professional, whether that be a local architect, aka AOR or executive architect. And in some cases, some countries, they, they, they're, the way they do projects is different. Like the architect contractor client relationship is, is very different. So in some cases, you might not actually have officially an executive or local architect on the project, but you would still have someone local who is sort of filling those same responsibilities, if that makes sense. Because right. some countries operate where like the architect and contractor is kind of one of the same, but their title might not be the same as, as what we do here. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so out of state, then you would have a, a local architect potentially if, they're, if your architect's not licensed there or they don't feel comfortable doing that. And then out of the country, uh, for sure, you'd have a local expert of some kind. The next scenario is, uh, let's say you do have an architect that you want to use for your project, but they don't have the technical knowledge or skills to execute that particular building type. Mm -hmm. um, and you actually see that the, the, the pairing of design architect and executive architect in this particular case more and more often these days, because 
some of the more specific building types, let's say like hospitals, libraries, schools, right? Those types of buildings, um, oftentimes these projects are um, given to an architectural office if they have done like one or two before. Right? Yes. Uh, they're called like what we what we what we call RFP, which is request for proposal. Mm -hmm. You know, like the city or whoever the client is will reach out to those firms and ask them to submit a proposal to be selected to maybe be the one designing that project. Mm -hmm. And if you've never done one, you have no chance in doing one because it's you know because you haven't like, done one because <laughs> you you're, they need you to have done some, but you haven't. So oftentimes, architects who haven't done any would partner. Mm -hmm. We have an executive architect who's done many of those types in order to kind of like get a foot in the door. The building type is a good point. So it's also if you're a client and you want to use an architect to design your building, you like their work, you like the personality, you feel like there's a good fit, but um, they don't have enough knowledge to design a hotel for you, mm -hmm. you know, a massive 300 unit uh, hotel. They, they don't have that capability to do that. They've never done it before. That is uh, another situation where then you would use an executive architect and pair them with your design architect. So you kind of get the best of both worlds in that sense. Yeah, it's actually a, um, it's actually kind of a win-win because not to be uh, making generalization here, but I feel like a lot of the firms who kind of like do that one same typology, especially in those types of buildings, let's say, mm -hmm. there maybe is a tendency to repeat yourself in the design. Yeah. So if you hire someone who's never done that before, you're probably going to get something that's a bit more unique, yep. but you pairing it with someone who has a lot of experience doing it. Mm -hmm. So yeah, you do get the best of both worlds. And, and you mentioned that this is becoming more common. And one of the reasons why it's becoming more common also is that buildings are just becoming more complicated. Yeah. It's, I mean, small build, houses are becoming more complicated and large buildings are becoming more complicated. And so, and we see this across all the different industries and professions. And so therefore there tends to be more, um, you find more people and professionals who are experts within a very specific, at a very specific thing. Yeah. And therefore you find that there has to be more collaboration between multiple different professionals or different offices just to cover all the bases. And that leads to the next scenario, which is, you know, you find an architect, but they only provide design services. Like they don't do any of the technical construction documents, permit approval. And you would actually find more and more offices doing that because let's let's face it, like as you said, the buildings are more and more complicated, and everything around getting them built is becoming more and more complicated. You know, such as getting permits approval or like doing construction documents. Yeah. Because of the complexity of construction these days, and some offices they're not interested in spending time or half of their career doing yeah. that kind of work. They just want to pretty much do the fun part, which is the yeah. design part. Yeah. Um, and therefore, that's not in their uh, in, in the, the types of services that they provide. And if that the office you want to work with then you definitely need the second half of of the architect to do the rest i think this is providing some good insight to how architects work and the architecture process for clients and non-architects who are listening because um the the, the technical parts of a project as we're calling them the construction documents and permitting all it's it's a lot it's, it's very, lot. very heavy, and there's a, a lot to know, and it's complicated, and that's where the liability exists, right? And so, yes, increasingly, there are more offices who are just not interested in doing that, right? Now, you know, are there limitations to being an architect who, who only understands design but doesn't understand the technical? Yeah, of course, because the two go hand in hand at some point. But nevertheless, there are offices that do that, and you'll often find that these offices... Um, they are, their portfolio usually has a greater diversity of work and, um, from the get go, right? Like it's, it's uncommon to, to come across a young office that has a bunch of different projects where they are the design architect and also architect of record. Because yeah. it's just expert, the expertise is too difficult to, to well, acquire in that short expertise, period of time. Well, it's the expertise, but it's also like how much time it takes to get this project through, right? Mm -hmm. If you take a typical project and you look at the length of the phases, right? Like if you just look at the design phases, um, kind of like overall design phases, nothing like too detailed, mm -hmm. it's much shorter than like the deep dive detail design phases that lead to construction, drawings, and yeah. all of that stuff. So if you kind of like... 
take that long chunk out of a project, then you have more time to do more of those design phases on other ones. Yeah. Therefore, you can build a greater portfolio. So it's kind of like a... You know. Yeah, and, and you know, construction documentation historically as a phase takes longer than all of the previous phases, right? So it, it is advantageous in some ways for an office to just do design because they can churn out a bunch of projects and there's not as much liability and it's fun, et cetera, et cetera. And like there's there is that for sure. Um the last scenario is kind of the opposite where maybe mm -hmm. you you have an architect you want to work with, but they only do kind of like the, the technical and um, act as an executive architect for other firms, mm -hmm. meaning they don't really do design. Yeah. Uh, and you would find offices that prefer doing that because they may be more interested in the technical aspects of putting together a building than like, you know, the aesthetics and the more sensitive approach to, um, mm -hmm. you know, designing a building. Because as much as the two are... are, are tied to each other they are different skill sets but well, they're kind like of having like the to, left and the right side of the brain right you know? yeah and, and having to work with a client through design and figure out what they like and what they don't like there's a lot of people skills involved and some architects just aren't interested in that so kind of classically within an architecture office an office who does both right you will find people within an office who grab they're all architects yeah. but they gravitate to warn toward one side or the other or even another niche than than what's been mentioned um, because it's a challenging thing to try to do both uh, real realistically for a single person. Yeah, and actually you will probably find that happening more often in smaller offices where, you know, there is a, a smaller group of employees or, or staff mm -hmm. and like that one person might be the one wearing like the Multiple different hats. hats. Yeah. Um, yeah. So why would you have two architects the first reason which is maybe the most common in a way is that your project is not local to the architect right so you need someone a local architect aor executive architect um, the other is that even if, if so let's say your project is local you could still have two architects because either the your design architect is not an expert in that building type or basically it comes down to that it's either one of two situations either you don't feel comfortable in your design architect being the architect of record, or it's the opposite. You have an executive architect who is skilled and detailed and technical, but you're like, eh, I'm not super sold on their like design capability, so I want to bring someone in who has like a different perspective. And uh, uh, both happen um, for large structures, maybe more commonly, but even for houses, it happens. For if we're talking about complex houses, it happens for sure. So what is the workflow like between the design architect and the executive one? It's a good question. This is where it varies greatly from project to project. I've seen it happen in many different ways, but maybe we can talk through the through the question through the by by discussing the architecture process. So the early uh, phases of the process, I would say schematic is or say concept design and like feasibility kind of research, right? You might think that the design architect is the one who leads all the design phases and then you just hand over those documents to the executive architect and they pick it up like a football and they just run with it and do their thing. But again, that transition is not so easy, it's not an easy break. So even in the very early phases, ideally you would have both architects because the local architect would be able to provide more information about the feasibility of certain things than your design architect. Right. You don't want your design architect to be designing really cool conceptual stuff and then you realize after you paid them this money and they've done all this work, oh, well, this was all based on uh, a false premise. We can't do that because we didn't consult the executive or the local architects. So this highlights actually that throughout the process, the two should be kind of talking to each other. Uh, maybe they're not all equally, they're not both equally invested in working at the same amount, but there should be a conversation. So it is true that the design phases, concept design, schematic design, the design architect is m doing most of the work and leading the process. But again, you want your executive there to be able to answer questions of, can we do this? You know? No. Um, and as you go on, the work starts to shift. The amount of work shifts from the design architect over to the executive architect. But still, the design architect would be involved. And the, and the feedbacks, the level of feedback shift, right? Like when mm -hmm. you're in the design phase, the technical architect might have some input as to what the design should be or could be based on, you know, their local knowledge. And then once you're switching to getting more into the construction and technical details of 
you know, the drawings, then the design architect just kind of like, you know, stays involved because you want to make sure that the design vision again is preserved. Yeah. Once we have to start, you know, actually um, figuring out how to put the building together. Yeah, um, and some people have this tendency to think that an, uh, a design architect uh, can produce a design package. So schematic design drawings, let's say. Right. And then you just, again, hand it over to this executive architect and they'll flesh it out and put in the details and you're good to go. Um, for large buildings or complex buildings or just really nice buildings, even so a custom home, right, at the smaller scale, that doesn't work. That does not work. You need your design architect to stay on through the entire process. So let's say specifically during construction documents, design development construction documents, because even during construction documents, which, you know, are very technical things, there's, there are for sure design decisions in every aspect of it. So very often uh, in the times where I was operating as a design architect and there was a, a local one abroad, um, they would produce the CDs, but they would send us their CDs, their construction documents, you know, at different phases. And we would redline them and say, no, you got to change yeah, this detail. Yeah. This is not what we intended. Because the, and it's not to say that the local architect is messing up. It's just that when you advance something from a schematic level to a highly detailed level, there's interpretation involved, right? And so the design architect would be the one to say, no, nah, you didn't quite understand what we were intending with this, with this gesture. You know. Yeah, I mean, you you kind of like imagine if if you are like a if you're a cook, mm. okay, and you're like, you know what, I want to cook like I want to cook like a chicken pot pie, and here is the list of ingredients, and then you hand it off to I don't know your sous chef, and you trust in them that they're gonna make it the way like you imagine on making it. Well, there is a lot of ways that it can be done differently. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You know, like. Yeah. Well, I don't know. Was the chicken roasted before you put it in? Like, what spices did you add on? Like, was it a homemade crust or did you buy it at the store? You know, there's a <laughs> lot of like small and small and big decisions that could really change like how that pot pie is going to taste in the end. Well, and so even after the construction drawings are done, then there yeah. is the whole like pricing and bidding of the project. Oh, and true. that's also yeah. when, you know, um, a lot of things get cut <laughs> a lot of things get what we call ve which means value engineering meaning yeah. we're going for a cheaper route than mm -hmm. what was originally selected and that's where things could start falling apart i mean imagine the chicken is the most expensive part of the pot pie we got to take it out well guess what it's <laughs> not a chicken pot pie anymore so yeah. if we put beef in there a uh, lot the same thing that's a great analogy though because for um for clients and maybe even the executive architect, let's say if the executive architect doesn't have the greatest design uh, vision, they might they don't have the expertise or or the, the the vision to to see which ingredients can be tweaked and removed entirely. Yeah. Where your design architect will, um, because they have this kind of third eye conceptual sense of what the project wants to become. And um, it's in an odd sensation when you when you talk to a client. They're like, "How about we cut out, you know, all the salt?" And you're like, "Yeah, can't do that." I understand salt is not the chicken, but we need salt. <laughs> we don't need the most expensive salt, but we also yeah, don't yeah, need yeah, to take yeah. it all out. Right? Yeah. Like there is a middle ground <laughs> that could satisfy everybody. Yeah. And then, as I was saying, I think keeping your archi your your design architect on during construction and administration is a very good idea, um, because always during construction, uh, the design has to change. Yeah. Um, sometimes to a great degree, hopefully not, but for sure in smaller degrees, which again, you know, death by a thousand cuts is one expression, change things ever so slightly many, many times and the project doesn't turn out the way it was supposed to be. Well, and again, I think if you bother to go the route of using the design architect and the AOR, mm -hmm. that means that you're interested in the design quality of your project. Mm -hmm. Therefore, I wouldn't compromise that by just cutting off the role of the design architect after the, the first round of design has been done. You know? Yeah, and so as a conclusion to this last segment, I think that one of the misconceptions people have, again, is that there's an easy and clean break between design and all the other stuff, and you don't need either of those two architects in either of their own phases, right? And for anything that's meant to be nice, a building that's meant to be high quality and interesting, no, it, it it absolutely does not work that way. And if you talk to any uh, good architect or even good contractor, they'll say the same thing. It it it, it doesn't function that way. 
I think the next thing would be maybe to talk about the advantages and disadvantages of having those two architects mm -hmm. working on mm -hmm. the project, mm -hmm. right? Um, yeah. I, well, we already kind of mentioned that, but the first couple advantages of having that pairing is that, again, you get the both the the, the best of both worlds, right? Yeah. You get the best design from the architect that you want and you and, and you like their work and you get the, the best technical knowledge and expertise and experience from that AOR. Yeah. Yeah, you kind of get the the exciting part of the creative artistic aspect of a designer, which is also the risky part, right? That's exciting. Yeah. You don't know what it's gonna be or it's gonna be something interesting and new, uh, but there's risk involved. And at the same time, you get the opposite. You get the other side of the pill, which is the assurance. Because you have someone who's an office who's been doing this for 30 years or whatever, and they only do this thing. So you know that even though you get the fun part, you're covered. There's a safety net underneath you is, is one way to think about it. Um, potentially also, if you have the right pairing, um, you, you know, speed is, is potentially one advantage because, again, you have experts. So instead of having your design architects spend a bunch of time trying to figure out stuff, they can just call the executive architect who says, yeah, we, we, we do it this way because of X, Y, and Z reasons, or no, you can't do it, mm -hmm. sort of, sort of as, a, as a shortcut in a sense. The disadvantages, there are potentially <laughs> several disadvantages. First of all, obviously, when you have more people, more chefs in the kitchen, it can be more confusing, and um, it can grind down the process and this leads to a bunch of other stuff, right? So the pro the schedule can take longer if there's more back and forth. That's easy to imagine. It can become confusing. It can also cost more if more time is being eaten up. Or you might be paying a premium to have both, um, even if the schedule stays on track or is shorter. So those are some of the disadvantages, potentially. Yeah, and, you know, uh, I think the biggest one is probably, like, set, again, setting up expectation and, and clear responsibility, like, who is doing what, mm -hmm. you know, like, who is leading the project? Is it the design architect or is it the executive architect? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, one would say that they're each leading their phases, right? Mm -hmm. So the design architect is leading the first part of the project and the executive architect is leading the second half. Yeah. Um, they each I, have yeah. to be good at doing that and knowing when to step back and let the other one, you know, do their thing. And I think that a lot of the disadvantages of having two architects, those can be mitigated um, and, and solved and, and avoided entirely if you have the right pairing, right? Yeah. If you don't have the right team, then no process and no project works. If you have the right team, then it works. Which is hard. I mean, yeah. you know, if you've never worked with either or and they've never worked with, with each other, like how do you know it's going to be the right pairing? So talking about that, there's a few things. Uh, first of all, making sure that both of the architects are able and maybe more importantly, willing and interested in being and having uh, only a portion of these services and responsibility, right? You don't want to have an executive architect who fancies themselves as a design architect and then... When your design architect is making design decisions, you, the AOR is always coming back with like random ideas. I think another thing that clients should be aware of is that um, when they approach architects to take on either role, like the design or the technical aspect, that they might refuse to, to take it on. Mm. You know, like if let's say you're an architect and you've been approached to be an architect of record for a project, mm -hmm. some of us might refuse to take it on because let's say they don't they don't quite align with the type of design that the client is looking for. Sure. And, and you know, that very much ties into the technical aspect of developing that into construction drawings. Like, let's say the design architect that's been hired only does curvy, crazy stuff. Mm -hmm. And the architect of record to be only does traditional things. Like, there is no alignment. You can't, you know, really force them to work together. It, it, it just won't work. Yeah, I, I think that that that's a good example because it highlights both an expertise deficiency because doing a tradition, if we're talking about houses, doing a traditional house is actually very different from doing what you described with curves and whatnot. Yeah. It's also an interest difference. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, like uh, I personally, we, we would be much more inclined to be an AOR of a really sleek contemporary house. I have no interest in being an AOR for like a, <laughs> pseudo french chateau traditional classical thing because it's not my it's not my interest like whatsoever yeah, yeah. um and so i it, it's tough to judge that for a client but i think that's definitely a factor yeah 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 the other thing is that an architect could refuse to be 
only the design architect on a project. And that's because, well, you know, if you let go the second half of a project to someone else, mm -hmm. there's no guarantee that what you've been designing is going to end up the way you've been designing it. Right, right. Therefore, why would you be interested in designing something, handing it off to someone else, see what yeah. happens, and maybe still be the author of it? Yeah. Yeah, this is a really good point. This is a really good point um, because we come across this fairly often. And again, I think it, it goes back to the larger issue of people thinking that you can just do a quick design and then you'll be good to go. And the rest is kind of going to be take care of itself. And there is people who do it. You know, there's people who yeah, like but it doesn't whip turn out. out <laughs> no, there's people who whip out design. Mm -hmm. And I'm not saying they're good in any way because, again, sure. there is, there's design, there's design, right? Sure, sure. Um, and then, yeah, they just head it off and like make some bucks and move to the next one and that's it. Yeah, no, that, that, and so, so we would fall into the category of the people that you're describing where it's, you know, for, for anyone who's in, for an architect who's interested in design, like seriously interested in design, you know, it's a it's a, it's a, it's a passion and, um, we're not in it to do a sketch and be like, okay, pay me for the sketch and I'm content with my life. No, we're in it to have really cool things and important things be built and constructed for realsies. <laughs> and if, if I can't make sure that that happens, then I'm not inclined to do it uh, for a number of reasons. One, it's not personally satisfying. Um, two, frankly, for portfolio, like I, I, I don't know how it's going to turn out. And three, I don't want a building out there that has my name associated with it when it didn't turn out the way it was supposed to because I didn't have control or hadn't, didn't have any say uh you know in the back like 80 percent of the project in terms of the timeline because really realistically realistically design is a really short duration compared to yeah. cds permitting and, and construction um so yeah i agree with that point for sure and i feel like that's maybe more common on like let's say developer driven projects yeah. right well yeah. maybe they want kind of like a, st a star architect or a little star architect to be the one providing the design for the house because you're just you know marketing wise it's just a better move mm -hmm. right but then they kind of like take on the back end of construction documents and and contracting and all of that stuff so it's kind of like you, you gotta know like what, what the deal is really to understand it yeah i know and and, and i know that there's like a, a the ideal way that things should be done, the ideal process, the ideal schedule, the ideal budget, the ideal team. And I understand that that rarely, if if never happens. And so there needs to, the process and team needs to be, um, you know, uh, choreographed a certain way, depending on the expectations of, of what you're trying to achieve, really high quality versus mid quality versus lower quality. That's fine. Um, but Again, if, if if anything on the nicer end, you, there are certain things you shortcuts you can't make. At the very least, you should have your design architect throughout the project, and for them to be available to provide input and phone calls and whatever else. Yeah. Because uh, why not? One thing I do want to talk about is people might be listening and wondering, okay, well, if I have myself an executive architect, then and they're the the architect of record then why do I need to use another licensed architect to design the building or the house or the whatever? Can't I use a designer, right? Which is an unlicensed architect. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. A home designer, a, a whatever, this enter designer. <laughs> Can I just- designer. I still don't know what a home designer it's is, just, you it's tell for, me. It's a, it's a title for people who actually aren't architects, but they needed a title, so they made themselves a title, <laughs> is what that yeah. is. But can I just use one of those folks and pair them with an executive architect? And the answer is 100% yes. Because like legally the responsibilities of the design architect and your designer or home designer or whatever the title, all the same. The difference is that you just want to make sure that the design professional person that you're using actually knows what they're doing when it comes to designing buildings, right? We know some really, really good architecture offices and the partners are not, in fact, they're actually not licensed architects, but they know what they're doing because they have an education in architecture. They studied architect. They studied well, architecture. They're, 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 they practice architecture. They're trained architects. They're everything that an architect is without the license. Convert, And then at the same time, there are many, 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 many designers out there who are not licensed as well. But they do not have any of that training or background or expertise. And as I said before, 
99% of the time, the people who can produce great design buildings are the ones who have that background. License aside, they, they have the, the architecture background, right? People who don't have that background, who have a background in something other random, or they did interior design or decorating, or they have a good eye, it doesn't work. It doesn't work. And the, the, the biggest problem in this scenario is that, again, you're going to end up paying for redundant work, meaning mm. you're going to pay that person to do the design. You're going to give it to the architect of record who actually is going to have to fix the design because mm -hmm. it wasn't designed correctly, you know, correct, correctly meaning like, you know, meeting building codes, m basic rational things that just don't make sense, right? So now you end up paying your technical architect to be doing design work when really that wasn't their role. Yeah. So I think it is very important to make the right pairing and understand really like who you're hiring. Yes, absolutely. And and even in the design phase, like I don't want people to think that designing a building is just making something pretty. Like it's way more complicated than that. There's like another 10 factors that any architect would consider which have nothing to do with, oh, these materials look nice to next to each other or I like squares and circles next to each other. <clears throat> Um, okay, so the last question is, how do I know if I need both architects or I need two? Well, we kind of already covered it, but honestly, if you're talking to a trusted professional, then they'll have an answer for you, right? Because uh, sometimes legally you will need both, and that's very, very clear. Other times, too, you, you, you actually don't need both. You could use one. But again, the professional you're considering using might say like, yeah, but this is not really my comfort zone, and I would feel more comfortable, and I think it'll be better for the project, you know, if we use a... Uh, architect of record most often and so that that's really or and if you're not sure then just reach out to us and we can give you an answer um, but that kind of covers the recording so um, in summary the difference between the two pretty clear by their titles right uh, you would need both uh, most often if a project is not local to your design architect to your architect and um, again if it's a building type or building expertise that uh, they don't one or the other doesn't have anything else no, I think that's pretty clear. Um, I mean, another thing could be, let's say, uh, if you wanted to get those uh, construction drawings and permitting sooner, let's say the design firm that you hi that you hire is very small. It's like three people, right? And they don't have the, the staff capacity in producing the document as quickly as you wish mm -hmm. for your schedule to move forward. Then maybe they could partner with another firm who yeah. could provide that and just kind of like, you know, put it through. Yeah, I don't want people also thinking that having two architects is crazy uncommon or it's crazy more expensive or or way more complicated. It's not necessarily the case if you have that right pairing. And the big thing with having the right pairing also is having a clear structure of who's responsible for what. Yeah. If you have that, then it's not a problem. And it's pretty common for two different ar architecture offices to work with each other, like super common for large structures. Thank you, everybody, for listening to this episode. If you like what we do, please subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, everywhere you can find us. Yep. We're also on social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram, mostly Instagram. You can send us DMs, you know, see what we're up to. We're posting pretty regularly on there. We also have the hotline, 213-222-6950. Mm -hmm. That you can text or leave a voicemail. Um, I think we are going through the questions right now that we're getting from you. And you can also find the office, which is famearchitects.com. And we have all the social medias for that one as well. Yep. Right? Yeah. Awesome. Thanks for listening. Any questions, send it to us and we'll talk soon. Bye. Bye-bye.